The layers of time often hide what was once clearly seen. Centuries of addition and interpretation can conceal the artist's original intent. But what if we could peel back the layers and restore the original beauty underneath? This Lent, we engage in the restorative work of removing layers of misunderstanding in order to rediscover the unvarnished Jesus. Day in Lent, and I know many of you are enjoying uh, reading through the book. It's 46 daily readings through the season of Lent, and we also have two connect groups that have started that are discussing this reading. I've seen pictures from those, and uh, I want to thank those of you who are involved in connect groups discussing the reading. So every day you have a, a short reading, and then you can talk about it in your connect group, and then there's a sermon about the upcoming readings for the week. So today I am covering days 19 through 25, and uh, you, you can still participate. You can still buy the book wherever you buy books, and, and if you go to our Facebook page, you can get information about the connect groups. Still time to do that. And uh, uh, I've been enjoying just getting into these readings. It's not overwhelming. You know, if you've been around church as long as I have, you've you maybe had like daily devotions. People talked about devotions and maybe, you know, you, you weren't exactly, um, you know, faithful and, you know, maintaining daily devotions and that was guilt producing and so on. But uh, these, are, these are short readings, but they're, they're great. And it helps me, I have found, to get in touch with Jesus, the Jesus of the Gospels and so today we're going to cover 19 through 25, days 19 through 25, and I picked up on a, a common theme in these readings, and, and hopefully today we can start to see more of that, you know, that old, that varnish wiped away and see Jesus shining through. So last weekend, nine of us from here in the congregation traveled uh, to North Baja, Mexico. It's about 50 miles south of San Diego to an orphanage uh, called Ninos de Baja. And, you know, whenever you travel, uh, you get outside of the country, you kind of get a different perspective of America, and you get a little bit of uh, distance. And, and so I had some of those thoughts and feelings as we traveled. And then, of course, just going down to Ninos, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a foster home. The Mexican foster, hair, uh, foster care system is still orphanage-based, and, and so are these Casa Hogar's all over Mexico, they're, they're orphanages, and they have about 40 to 50 kids at Ninos, and these are kids who were removed from their homes because of abuse, neglect, maybe the parents you know, were uh, involved in, in drug use and couldn't care for those kids. Some of those kids have uh, suffered in, in heinous ways and removed from their parents and, and then uh, brought by the police to Nino Stabaja, and, and so thinking about their experience, you know, what, what have they experienced, but then also, as I'm going to, to share today, what I saw at Nino Stabaja, and, and what love can do, what, what a family can do, the kind of healing that can happen there, and, and so we're beginning what we hope will be a years-long relationship with Nino Stabaja, and have some exciting things in the future we'll share. We're going to go back. If, if you would like to go with us next time, you know, we're going to uh, put another date on the calendar. And then once you uh, leave today, you can stop by a table here to your right outside. If, if you haven't sponsored a child and you're able to, you could stop by the table there and look at child sponsorship. Hannah and I sponsor a, a girl named Lydia who actually has, I believe, five younger siblings that she essentially cared for before they went to Ninos together. Ninos tries to keep families together. So uh, I know many of you sponsor kids, and we got to go down, and some of you sent gifts uh, that they, they opened. And we got to see Lydia open her, her gift. And it was just it was a special time. So I want to show you if you, is it okay if I show you some photos? I'm that guy anyway. I, I show unsolicited photos of my kids bragging about them and vacation all the time. And so here's, a, here's some mission trip photos. So uh, first of all, this is a group of us that uh, went down. And let's see, this is right after we completed our work project. So on Saturday morning, we went and reorganized the storage uh, facilities. So they have several buildings where they store donations, bicycles. And, and Dale here in the church, brought, he fixes up bicycles and takes them down uh, for, the, for the kids to enjoy. And so we reorganized the, all the storage, the food pantries, the school supplies, all these things. And uh, struck me, some of the uh, items we moved around were for uh, quinceañeras. 
So when a, a girl turns 15 in Mexican culture, there's a celebration for her. And so they had all these cool little uh, like table decorations for quinceañeras. And it just reminded me, you know, creating special moments for these kids. And, and do need to say that this isn't a beautiful place. I, I wasn't prepared for where Ninos is located. I had not been in this area before. It's essentially the Napa Valley of Mexico. And some of you are like, okay, sign me up for the next trip. I'll be there. Um, it's a beautiful place of vineyards and olive groves. I think I have a photo on the way. This is on the drive. How about that? Uh, that's on the drive down. That's pretty close to Porvenir, uh, the town where Ninos is located. And at this point, maybe, I don't know, maybe we were a 30 to 40 minute uh, drive from the Pacific in Ensenada. And so if you are familiar with Southern California, this is the same geography that would run down like the, you know, the what are the east side of Los Angeles, down like Poway, La Mesa, San Diego. It's the same kind of geographic formation, but here it just becomes this Mediterranean climate of, of vineyards and olive trees. There were olive trees at the guest house where we stayed, um, and uh, I don't know if you can see it here, but there were a couple of uh, hammocks stretched across between the olive trees. So an olive grove with, grove with, with hammocks. Again, sign me up. And then we met the kids the first night we were there, last Friday night, and then the director, Mike, and uh, uh, we uh, got the tour of the houses where the kids live. I didn't take a whole lot of photos, you could imagine, for privacy concerns. Um, this shows one of the, the, the bedrooms. The, the children are divided up into four houses uh, that are close to each other just by age and, and gender. So you see a couple of the uh, teenagers who went on the trip with us, and then those are you know, a few of the, the beds. And, um, and then Saturday and Sunday, we got to play uh, with the kids out in the, the courtyard where they have meals. This is me pretending that I'm going to stop this kid from scoring on me, which did not happen. I, I hung for about 20 minutes. You can see Jimmy back there. He lasted longer than I did. And these kids just ran circles around us, and they, they played soccer for like four hours. I mean, just constant uh, constant activity. They, were play, they have playground equipment there, and... and um, it was just a, a great time hanging out. I think I have another photo of uh, Dale and Patty's daughter, Dory. She gathered some of the students, and they made origami together, uh, some, of the, some of the kids there at, at Ninos. And so they have about 40 to 50 kids, and on Saturday and Sunday afternoon, they just all hang out in this courtyard. They have picnic tables there, like you see, and then soccer and playground equipment. There are citrus trees, so the kids will just pick oranges and, and, and have a snack right there and just hang out. And, and play. And um, I know many of you do sponsor a child, but I, just, I have a graphic, actually. Uh, if you want to sponsor a child, and you haven't yet, and you're able, uh, you can stop by the table out here to do that. That's actually one of the... Uh, sorry, sorry, Susie. I, I jumped ahead. You can go back to that. That's one of the house parents. So each house has house parents, and then they have, uh, along with them, tias, which I guess is aunts or aunts in Spanish, who care for the kids. And so the ratio is, is good, um, where you have adults who are there to care for the children. You see some of those, uh, those sweet little kids, you know, some of the littles uh, that, uh, that call Ninos home now. And, and I was struck by the smiling faces. Um, and you go, you know, anytime you go on a, a mission trip, or, you, you know, you, you kind of think, okay, am, is, am, am what I seeing, is it real? You know, are they kind of putting on a show? And it's tough to put on a show for four or five days. So I didn't see any of that. I saw genuine um, smiles and joking around with each other and, and love. The first night we got there, Friday night, it was pretty chilly there. And we went and, and met the kids in, in their houses, and they were all bundled up with blankets, just sitting on these big sectional couch, uh, couches together, watching, watching movies and just hanging out and... and playing games, and there was just a lot of laughter. And, and, uh, and you could tell there's, just, there's love in the house and, and fun. And so you can go to that next one, Susie. Thank you. If you would like to sponsor a child, you can stop by after the, uh, after the, the service here and, and pick up a packet. Dale and Patty and, and their daughter Dory would be happy to, uh, to talk with you. And, and thinking here in the future, where do we go forward from here in addition to child sponsorship? A couple of years ago, we canceled the worship service one day, and we did a serve day, and we collected items for people who are experiencing homelessness. How many of you were here 
Was that fun? That was pretty cool, right? People have like said to me, when are we going to do that again? And so I thought, you know what? Why don't we uh, have a serve day where all of us in the church for, you know, a month in advance, uh, we start just donating toiletry items, you know, shampoo, soap, because that's the biggest need here, 40 to 50 kids, socks, you know, conditioner, toothbrushes, toothpaste, that kind of thing. If we start to donate that as a congregation, pool our resources, and then on one of the Sundays here coming up in the next few months, we'll cancel the worship service, we'll set up a bunch of tables out there in the lobby, and then we can all just organize all those supplies and put them in the tubs, and then a team could take those down to Ninos. What do you think? Is that a good idea? Think that'd be good? And all of us, no matter if you're able to go or sponsor or whatever, we can, we can all be a part in some way to bless these kids' lives. And it's going to a good cause and uh, a healthy atmosphere where these kids are loved. And I just think that would be a fun way for all of us to participate. So stay tuned, and we'll, we'll, we'll get some things on the calendar for that. So um, the stories that, that got these kids to Ninos to Baja... Uh, are many of them stomach-turning, as you would imagine. And I'm not going to tell, you know, detailed stories on the Internet here. But you could use your imagination. Some of these kids have experienced horrible mistreatment. Uh, Some were found essentially homeless uh, due to neglect. Some of them were terribly abused by their parents or parents. And it's not a surprise because that's why they're in the foster care system. It's also not a surprise, though, because we know that the world we live in can be a rough place. And and by rough place, we mean that we live in a world where people are mistreated. All of us have been, to some extent, in various ways in our lives. Maybe you have suffered what would be abuse. Maybe it's not that, but we've all experienced conflict and people treating us in ways uh, that we uh, that were hurt that hurt us, uh, diminishing us, uh, bullying, um, estrangement. Uh, there can be religious treatment that causes pain. It creates conflict. It hurts us. It cuts us deeply. Sometimes those scars take years to heal from. Some of us feel like, well, maybe we're not healed from those things. And so I was thinking about what these kids have experienced. And then also getting out of the country for a few days uh, to a completely different culture, you know, caused me to kind of, you know, look at America from the outside looking in and think about what life is like for all of us and and the culture that we live in now of so much divisiveness and even cruelty. I mean, let's be honest, there, there is cruelty now out in the open overtly in American culture, and that's, that's just the kind of environment we live in. And then we have the same stuff that always happens. You have family conflict. You have job and work relationships, and where we just live in a world that can be a rough place. And we're in this series about removing varnish and seeing the original Jesus. And Jesus experienced this world as a rough place, mistreatment, Abuse. Jesus was abused. That's safe to say. Uh, Jesus was abused. And so there's some readings this week uh, that talk about how Jesus dealt with that. The realities of living in this world with mistreatment and pain and conflict and how we deal with that. So the first reading I wanted to point out uh, comes from Luke chapter 13. We actually read this scripture a few weeks ago when we talked about why God allows or apparently uh, seems to allow suffering, but I want to look at it today from a different angle. The old rabbis would talk about looking at the scripture like turning a gem, and you see the light refracting in different ways. I've never, never seen a gem this large in my life, but that seemed like a good gesture. I was thinking more of a cubic zirconia. Uh, but they will turn the gem, and they will see the light refracting in different ways, and the scripture can be like that. So let's read the scripture together, Luke chapter 13. Now, there were some present at the time who told Jesus about Galileans who were, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Pontius Pilate, the governor, had these people killed while they were worshiping, had people killed by Roman soldiers while they were essentially in church, while they were worshiping. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, what's his answer? No, no. 
But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Okay, that's an interesting phrase. We didn't talk about that much last time, a few weeks ago. Verse 4, are those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, what was his answer? No. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. That's an interesting phrase. Unless you repent, you too will all perish. And, and in my background, that, that tends to be interpreted as, okay, we need to repent of personal sin of some kind so we can, we can have personal salvation and go to heaven someday when we die. And that's the interpretation. Maybe there are shades of that here. But in the immediate context, that's probably not what Jesus was actually talking about. Where Jesus lived in what is now Israel, many of you know this, uh, the land was occupied by the Roman Empire. It had been occupied for decades. And there was always a violent uprising, bubbling, just beneath the surface in what is now Israel, to resort to political violence, to defeat the Romans, and expel them from the land. And during that time, there were lots and lots of leaders who claimed to be the Messiah. And in, in Jewish thought, the Messiah was kind of a, a, a superhero figure. Uh, it's not a coincidence, like Superman was created by two Jewish kids. Um, the, it's, Superman's kind of a messiah. Um, the messiah would be a, a, a military leader, a, um, a governor, a spiritual leader, and, and would, would be able to free the people from all oppression. All oppression shall cease. And, and, and would, would, would vanquish enemies. And, and would just basically you know, arrive on the scene and, and, and kick butt and take names. That was the concept of the Messiah. And as we said before, that's what Jesus' disciples thought he was going to do. Because that's what everybody thought the Messiah was going to do. So there were lots of Messiahs who would rise up and, and try to lead some kind of revolution to kick out the Romans. They wanted to resort to political violence. And you can kind of see why, because the Romans abused them. The Romans mistreated the people they were occupying. And, and and, and so these violent uprisings were a response, and so it was kind of mistreatment, abuse from the Romans, and it was like, okay, there's going to be an uprising, we're going to get revenge on them, and then, and then a group would resort to violence, the Romans would smash them, and just rent, you know, rinse, uh, wash, rinse, repeat. It's just a never-ending cycle of these uprisings, and then the Romans would smash it. And, and so Jesus... Here, and when he talks about this passage, he's addressing things that actually happened like this. Pilate had people killed while they were worshiping in a synagogue. And something that heinous, you know, of course, we never thought uh, could happen in our lifetimes. Maybe you view that differently now in the environment that we live in. Or, but when horrible treatment happens either by the government or by some people in the culture, or it could be family, it could be people you trusted, it could be people at work even in, in office politics. When, when you experience abuse and mistreatment, of course it's natural to say, no, we're going to get them. We're going we're gonna to fight back. We're going to get revenge on them. And Jesus seems to be addressing that kind of natural feeling here when he says, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. So perish there may not mean, you know, you die and go to hell. It might mean you get killed by the Romans. This never-ending cycle of seeking revenge and, 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 and just, you know, have these, having these violent uprisings, it, it's just never going to lead anywhere positive. Jesus said this in other ways. See if you can help me out. If you live by the sword, you will... Yeah, and, and, and so Jesus just, he seems to see things differently, how to respond to abuse and mistreatment. And then centuries later, Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. would take a, a nonviolent approach to resist abuse and mistreatment. And then by the time the Gospels were written, maybe 70, 80, 100 AD, depending on the scholars you read, the Romans had already destroyed 
Jerusalem. If you know a little bit of biblical history, you know this. It's not, it's not uh, discussed uh, in, in, in the Gospels, but in 70 A.D., and Brian touches on this in the book, uh, a Roman general, Titus, who later became an emperor, marched on Jerusalem for the final time in August of 70, killed thousands and thousands of people, and leveled the city. Not one stone was left on top of the other. When I was in Israel in 2012, we visited Masada, which is a, a massive mountain range with a fortress on top of it. If you're here locally, picture the Superstition Mountains with a fortress on top of it. And, uh, and some fled from Jerusalem to Masada. It was actually Herod's escape route. And some people knew about it, and some of the, some of the, the folks from Jerusalem fled there to try to flee from the Romans. And they went on to the top of Masada and locked themselves in this fortress. And for two years... The Romans built a ramp up to the top of that mountain. You can still see the base of that ramp. And and Jesus seemed to understand when people act violently toward you, when they abuse you, when they mistreat you in some way, if you respond in kind, if you return their violence for violence, if they abuse you so you abuse them, if they cuss you out so you cuss them out, if they build an alliance against you and smear you, then you smear them. And it's tit for tat. It's always this back and forth. That's not going to lead to anything good. As a matter of fact, you may perish unless you repent. Now, repent means to turn, to change your mind. Do a U-turn. I've been thinking about it this way, so I'm going to think in a different way about it. When people hurt you, you might want revenge. But revenge and returning you know, tit for tat, it creates this never-ending cycle of a back and forth. Nothing is ever settled. The conflict in the Middle East is still going. And, and sometimes it escalates to the level that it, it's, it's far worse than had you just walked away. And so if we want to see the real Jesus, one of the things we can see in Jesus is when people hurt you, reject the urge to strike back and get revenge. It might feel good at the time. It might sound like the right course of action at the time. It might make you feel better temporarily. Jesus says, you want to change your mind or you can end up perishing. You just want to change the way you think about that. Intentionally decide, yeah, it might feel good. It's it's not going to lead to anything good. Jesus said, unless you change your mind, you too will perish. Now, if you're in a situation where you actually are being abused, there's physical abuse or there's emotional name-calling, intimidation, control, uh, you want to just leave the situation. There are pastors who, what, for whatever reason, who knows? I can't explain the bat blank reasons that some pastors say what they say in the United States. I have no idea. I can't, okay, but there there are pastors that will seem to tell people to stay in abusive situations. Not me. Get out. Uh, get out of the situation as quickly as possible. Get to a safe place. There's no other way. You can forgive people from a distance. You don't have to. Everybody with me on that? You get out of that, get it out of that situation, okay? Most of the time, when people go through conflict, it's not necessarily abuse, but it's bad communication. It's gossip, it's pettiness, it's back and forth, it's misunderstanding, it's years of resentment. You see this in family, you see it in marriages, you see it in dating, you see it in friendships, you see it at work, you see it at church, everywhere, where there's mistreatment or misunderstanding or miscommunication. And then we, we tend to just retreat into tribalism and, and, and building alliances and, and gossip and smearing and then trying to get revenge in some way, using other people as pawns. And Jesus says, you just want to change your mind on that. You just want to change your way of thinking. Repent. Change your mind. Or you too will perish. It's just not the way of Jesus. And And then Brian goes on in the second reading. He talks about how this escalates into really mob behavior. Uh, You see it in society, what used to be called Twitter, now called X. You see mob behavior. In our politics here in a presidential election year, you see mob behavior. It's true when we have, you know, family issues. People build alliances, gossip. It creates mobs. Of, you know, isolating and alienating people and then attacking them. And so the reading for tomorrow is a famous story in John chapter 8, uh, the woman caught in adultery. 
and, and uh, just an interesting passage with all kinds of cultural implications, but let's just read that. Uh, John chapter 8, verse 1. We want to see the, the original Jesus, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Or I thought of the Mount of Olives. I thought of olive trees when I was down at Nino Sabaha. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his fingers. Speculation, what was Jesus writing? We have no idea. But verse 7, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, This is a famous statement. Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. The old way, let those without sin cast the first stone. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground, maybe to give them time to change their minds. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Woman is, it doesn't come across in English the way that it was in this time. It was not a disrespectful way to refer to her. Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So when you've heard this passage preached on in the past, hopefully the pastor pointed something out. They only caught the woman. Isn't it strange how that works? The guy who was just running free somewhere. Uh, so he gets away somehow, Right. But they bring this woman caught in adultery, and, and, and they're testing Jesus to see if he's going to be faithful to the law of Moses. And if he's not, then they can accuse him. By this time, the practice of stoning had pretty much, uh, thankfully, diminished. But in the Old Testament, you could get stoned for all kinds of things. You could disobeying your parents. Most of us would not be here right now if we were living under those laws. But stoning means that a bunch of people in the village pick up big rocks, and they throw rocks at you until you die. That's what stoning is. It's mob violence. And so Brian writes that stoning is this, is this form of mob violence in which it's not just one person attacking somebody else, but it's forming this, this tribal alliance where we have, we've, we've said bad things and this person is bad and we're all going to gang up on this person and we're going to kill this person. We're going to get rid of them. The outsider, the transgressor, the black sheep... We're all going to just gather together and we're going to pick up rocks and we're all together as a mob. We're just going to throw rocks at this person until they die. It's basically Facebook with rocks. That's what it is. And where you can just gang up and, 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 and we can all decide, no, this person is bad, so we can all just you know, render you know, vigilante mob justice. Reminds you of lynchings. Uh, and this is typical human behavior. In, in the United States, we were not prepared for cable news and social media. We weren't prepared for what it was going to do to us. It can be a form of propaganda. It is a form of propaganda. And mob violence. It's online stoning where humans can act like you know, just chimpanzees ganging up on someone and destroying them, and Jesus stopped this mob violence and the stoning of this woman. Jesus resisted the urge to get revenge on people who mistreated him, and he stopped mob violence. A few weeks ago, some of you may have seen this online because I asked Matt to post it in our, our message board. I apparently responded to a Facebook phishing email. They got me. Um, and it looked, it looked real, but you know, they got me. So my Facebook account got suspended and there was a link that said, go to Oculus. And I, you know, Meta is the company that owns Facebook now, if you follow this. And then Oculus is, is, uh, another, uh, service they have. And, and I had never been on Oculus. I have no idea what it is. So I clicked on that link and I was able to create this, uh, account with Meta. And I got into a forum where apparently thousands of people fail, you know, fell for this phishing email. And so I was, uh, I was off Facebook for about a week and a half, just got reinstated this past Thursday. Now, 
I use Facebook to communicate with people in the church and, you know, make announcements and sometimes messenger and that kind of thing. Besides that, I'll be honest with you, I didn't miss it. Uh, I, I wasn't shedding any tears over not being on Facebook. Now, we have people watching the service on Facebook right now. So you can use it for good things. And you can, you can share, you know, uh, with your family photos. And you can talk with people. You can have calls on Messenger. You can show photos of cats. You know, you can look at pictures of cats on Facebook. But on the other hand, it can be used for mob behavior and just present an image of ourselves. And, and Jesus seemed to, seemed to take the, the approach when we are mistreated, when we are hurt, when we see something we don't like, even too, with somebody we don't like, you see mob behavior for what it is, whether online or in your relationships, and you take the high road. Take the high road. See the mob behavior for what it is and take the high road. Refuse to gossip. Refuse to gang up on people you don't like. Refuse to throw stones. Refuse to, you know, engage in, you know, warlike mob behavior uh, against somebody else. So the, the drive down to Ninos, several hours, and uh, we rented a, a passenger van and then some other folks uh, drove separately, took donations in their vehicles, and I rode with Dale and his daughter Dory, and, and Dale's on the board at Ninos, he has been for years. Dory actually lived there for four years as a Tia, helping to care for kids. And, and I had a great time, you know, riding to Ninos and back with them. And when you have a long car ride with somebody, you get to know them a little bit better. And, and I've discovered that Dale is one of the most intelligent, knowledgeable people I know. Dale is one of those guys where he knows something about everything. He just, he just has that kind of a, a, a brain. And he spent his career in engineering. He saw the development of the desktop computer through the 80s, 90s, and today, and I picked his brain about what that was like, and, and, and I, I love that stuff. I just love hearing how things came to be, why things are the way they are. And on the way back, I was picking his brain about electrical engineering, and so I learned all about, you know, uh, currents, but I love guitar and learned about how some of these instruments work and that kind of thing, how to fix some things, and it was just a, it was a great convo. And then we talked about our spiritual backgrounds and, and what life was like uh, for him, and, and we talked a little bit about how, you know, a few decades ago, uh, of course, uh, America's always gone through times of upheaval. Churches were divided by uh, their stances on, on race, when there were churches who said, no, um, we believe in civil rights. There were people who left those churches and started new churches. And then, of course, the Vietnam War created all kinds of uh, conflict in America, uh, at the same time, as Dale and Dory and I were talking, churches didn't tend to divide over who the president was at the time. Um, churches didn't divide over whether they're going to vote for Nixon or Kennedy. In, in the debate, sometimes you couldn't tell the difference between the two. And up until recent times, that was the case, where churches didn't generally split apart by who, you know, according to who is running for president. And we just kind of talked about it as we were riding in the van on the way back here, actually, how it didn't used to feel like a blood sport the way it does now. It's political life in America. But we're living in a different reality now, where it just seems like America is, you know, there, there are mobs. There are mobs who are throwing stones online, maybe some of those have hit you. Maybe you have been hit by some of them. It's a painful realization when you discover that some of your family members are in that mob. Some of the people in your church are in that mob, maybe a former church. Uh, you have longtime friends who are in that mob, and you get hit by stones. And it just seems like, for, for most of us at least, this is the first time in our lives when we have experienced something like that, but when we get through these layers of varnish and we want to see the original Jesus, Jesus stopped mob behavior. So, no, we're not going to engage in that. We're not going to lash out in revenge. We're not going to, we're not going to engage in stone throwing. 
We're just not going to do that. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to take the high road. We're going to believe in something better and higher than that. This coming Wednesday, we have a group uh, that's continuing to meet called Pray It Forward. And it's an online support group and prayer group for people who would like to pray for our country, for people who are feeling anxiety about politics and and what's happening. I imagine that includes about 99.9% of you here. If you were honest and Maybe you, feel, you don't feel anxiety at this point. Maybe you will in November. Um, maybe you don't feel it right now. But this group exists as a way to come together and talk and process. Maybe you've been hit by some of those stones. And this is a group where you can come and say, I, yeah, I've, I've been hit by some of those stones. And here, here's how it affects my life. And here's you know, what I'm worried about. And You can pray together and have support. The Zoom link is in my, my weekly email that I talked about earlier, but encourage it. If, if this sounds interesting to you, check it out. This coming Wednesday, pray it forward. And then the last reading I'm going to cover today comes from Jesus uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane, as Brian writes, means olive press. So in that passage we just read, Jesus would go to the Mount of Olives. He would go to this olive grove on a hill outside of Jerusalem as a way to get away and pray. That was part of his, his practice in life, his rhythm of life, is he would get away to this olive grove and pray. And there's this garden, the Garden of the Olive Press, the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're going to take communion here in just a a few minutes. But on the night that Jesus was betrayed by Judas and arrested immediately after, he took his disciples back up to this olive grove where they apparently went often. And uh, uh, And Judas knew that. And so, you know, where, where can you find Jesus? He's probably in that olive grove. If he's not out teaching somewhere around Jerusalem, he's probably in that olive grove. And so Jesus goes to this place that has meaning for him, that is comforting to him, a place that is you know, kind of peace-producing for him. And he goes there to pray, and he knows that his time on earth is coming to an end. In Mark 14... We read this, they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Have you ever felt deeply distressed and troubled? Jesus said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. You ever felt that way? Some of us here have. Yeah, some of us here have. And he said to them, stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, Abba is like Dad. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. So Jesus has come to a point in his life when he is deeply distressed. His soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And he prays an intimate relationship with God like, Dad, God, uh, you can do anything. You have the power to change this. With you, everything is possible. Would you take this cup from me, meaning the cross, the crucifixion, the suffering, the pain of of abuse and mistreatment. Would you take this from me so I don't have to deal with this? And Brian writes uh, on page 102, our meditations on the man of sorrows begins as we see the humanity of Jesus pressed to the breaking point in Gethsemane, an Aramaic word that means oil press. It's here in the garden of the oil press that the anointed Messiah is under such pressure that he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. In Gethsemane, we see the two natures of Christ in one person. First, a human nature pleading, remove this cup from me. But then a divine nature adding, yet not what I will, but what you will. And Jesus prays, God, if you, if you would, take this cup from me, take this suffering from me, so there could be a different way and I don't have to suffer like this. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And, and we know what happened after that. And Jesus uh, was abused, whipped, beaten, mocked, made fun of, 
Put a blindfold on him who slapped you. Tell us who prophesy who slapped you. You're a prophet. Tell us who slapped you. A crown of thorns on his head. He says he's the king of the Jews. Well, here's your crown. Uh, and then put the, the sign above, uh, above him on the cross. Here's your king. Here's your king. Bullying, mocking, physically abusing, ultimately executing him. And then uh, what are the famous words he says on the cross? Father, forgive them for they, they know not what they do. And so Jesus, when we get through the, the layers of varnish, and this world's a rough place, Jesus chose love because it is the only hope for healing. And if we want to follow Jesus, we choose love because love is the only hope for healing. We resist the urge to try to get revenge and this never-ending cycle of violence. We, we reject mob violence. We take the high road. And we choose love because love is the only hope for healing. Once again, I'm going to say it. This, Jesus was crucified. That doesn't mean you stay in an abusive situation. You can remove yourself from that, right? We know why Jesus uh, was crucified. We, that's part of our faith. But Jesus chose love because love is the only hope for healing. And in this act that we're going to demonstrate here in a moment, Jesus chose love and, and, and showed how we heal showed the only path there, there is to any kind of potential reconciliation or mending of relationships or getting to an understanding, a mutual understanding. Maybe there isn't in your relationships. Maybe reconciliation isn't possible. Paul tells us, as far as it depends on us, live at peace with everyone. You clean your side of the street. It's not always possible to reconcile. You, you may not be able to trust somebody. Trust needs to be rebuilt. If you, if you can't trust somebody, you can't have a real relationship with that person. But what Jesus shows us is you choose love, you reject revenge, you reject mob violence, you refuse to participate in mob behavior. And choosing the way of love is the only possible potential way of living in this world that is a rough place and seeing any kind of good and healing come out of it. We choose love because love is the only hope for healing. And I'm going to close with this. Um, my biggest takeaway uh, from my time at Ninos de Baja this past weekend uh, was that the kids at Ninos are loved. There is love in the house, and, and Dale said it best. We, we were talking about this a couple days into the trip. He, he said, you know, American mission teams come down here expecting to see these sad, poor little Mexican orphans. And what they find is often a family that is actually laughing and having more fun than their family at home. And if you've been on mission trips before, you know that is often the case, where you think you, you're going to go down and bless these people, and you find out that you are the one who was blessed. And there is love in the house at Ninos. The kids are well taken care of because of your involvement, because of your sponsorship, because of the donations, because of the teams going down to serve and, and support that. It's a loving, healthy environment. And it's better than what a lot of kids experience. You can't buy enough iPhones and video games to, to buy happiness. And these kids who, they don't have that stuff, but they get to play soccer and do origami and hang out with each other, and play on the playground, and um, there is nothing that can replace love. Back in the 70s, John Lennon wrote a song called Mind Games, and the climactic lyric in that song is, love is the answer, and you know that for sure. Love is the answer, and one of the boys at Ninos, who maybe 16, 17 now, um, he came to Ninos when he was five years old, uh, and um, I heard a little bit about his story, and so I'll, I'll share that with you. When he was five, his, his mother, I, I don't know all the circumstances around it, but his mother burned his face. And you can still see a couple of scars here and there. And uh, she was arrested, he was immediately removed, and he was brought to Ninos de Baja. And his you know, mother uh, served her sentence, and apparently she, after so many years, 
uh, she was eligible to regain custody of him. And several years had gone by, and he was old enough to make a decision about where he wanted to live. And uh, he said um, that he forgave his mom for what she did, but uh, Ninos es mi familia. Ninos is my family now. And he chose to stay. And, and so uh, he's almost at the age now where he's going to graduate out of the program and carry on with his adult life after living in a loving, healthy, happy home with all these other kids. There's one other uh, young woman now who is in her, I believe, her early 20s. And she's the first you know, graduate of Ninos to get married, and now she's expecting a baby. And she just came back. So now they're going to have a baby that's a part of this big, happy family at Ninos de Baja. I think she's due in June. And so now they're seeing it come full circle to where you know, these kids who, are, who have grown up in this happy family are now becoming adults. And they're able to come back on family day and see you know, their siblings and the other kids who are living in this happy home. And these kids experienced all kinds of abuse and mistreatment to get them there because this world's a rough place. And maybe you have experienced abuse, mistreatment, the pain of conflict. We reject the urge to get revenge. We reject mob violence and mob, mob behavior. Jesus chooses love. And these kids have experienced the healing power of love, that love is the answer. And that's the same for you and me. So we're going to take communion now, thinking of the original Jesus with these layers of varnish removed. And if you're watching with us online, you can pick up a piece of bread and a beverage wherever you are and participate with us. But on the night he was betrayed... In the Garden of the Olive Press, uh, Jesus shared a meal with his disciples. He took a piece of bread. He thanked God for it. He broke it, and he said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat it, remember me. Let's eat of the bread right now. In the same way, he took the cup. He thanked God for it, and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. Love is the answer. As often as you drink it, remember me. Let's drink from the cup. Oh God, we thank you as we demonstrate right now, as we reenact what Jesus did there in the upper room and in the garden and on the Friday before Easter, we see the original Jesus underneath the layers of varnish and the way that Jesus has been co-opted to fit certain agendas and we're able to see that the way of Jesus leads to life and not to perishing. Jesus said to the people who wanted to get revenge on the Romans and violently kick them out, repent, change your mind, or you too will all perish. They're going to kill you too, just like they've killed the others. Jesus says, change your mind. There's a better way. We resist the urge to get revenge. We, we take the high road instead of engaging in mob behavior, and we choose love. If, if there's truly an abusive situation, we remove ourselves and our loved ones from that. But when it comes to miscommunication and misunderstandings and conflict and, and hurt, we want to change our minds. And to the best of our ability, as far as it depends on us, we want to choose love because it is the only hope for any kind of potential healing. We thank you, God, that love is the answer. It's the answer for these kids who found themselves at Ninos and now have a just completely different trajectory of life than they would have had. We thank you for that ministry, oh God, and the people who went down there. God, we thank you that we have the opportunity, whatever it is we're facing, to choose love. And we thank you for the healing that you will bring in our lives Maybe in the relationship, maybe not, depending on the other person, but for the healing that is made possible by love. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said,